today's installment of the Letterboard of Truth, our quote of the day is... Insert edgy joke. That's what all the hit comedians are doing these days. Many would say laughter is the best medicine. Unless you're talking to a crunchy mom who would argue that lavender oil is the best medicine because it lowers your blood pressure, improves gut health, cures 10 different kinds of ass cans. But I think we'd all agree that comedy is a staple in our lives. It is subjective, of course. There are 13 distinct styles of comedy, including slapstick, parodies, and deadpan humor that all appeal to different groups of people. We use humor as a way to boost our moods, connect with others, and most of all, cope with the difficult parts of life. This is why dark humor is one of the most popular comedic genres. Dark humor, also called black humor or gallows humor, is a style of comedy that makes light of difficult or taboo subjects, such as death, illness, and mental health. Black comedy can make the healing process a lot easier for those who are going through tragedies and hardships. While intended to be obscene, when does dark humor go too far? That is the question we'll be looking into today as we discuss the recent controversy with Matt Reif, a popular TikTok comedian who's gotten called out recently for some distasteful jokes in his Netflix comedy special, Natural Selection. While Matt Reif is currently the most viewed comedian on TikTok with over 18 million followers and 385 billion likes, he's been around a lot longer than we think. At just 17 years old, Matt purchased a one way ticket to LA to pursue his dreams in stand-up comedy and acting. I was walking down the sidewalk and one stopped me. He goes, uh, young man, I'm asking something. How old are you? I was like, man, it's really none of your business. He goes, God damn right, it ain't none of my business. Did you just shimmy away from me? He's been in quite a few popular shows like Fresh Off the Boat and Brooklyn Nine-Nine, but Matt's career really took off when he became a regular on Nick Cannon's Wild and Out, a comedy and rap improv game show. In total, Matt was on Wild and Out for five seasons with 29 episodes under his belt. Fans of the show dubbed him as the Justin Bieber of comedy, if you say so. Doja, I, um, I, heard, I heard you date white dudes. So, the longer you keep that water in your mouth, the more clothes I'm gonna take off. Matt began posting clips of his stand-up on social media a few years ago, mainly snippets of his crowd work. This is what he'd eventually become most known for. That and the infamous clip of Matt undoing his belt with one hand. You chose three hours to see me? Oh my god, is this $900? $900? Oh my god, I'm so sorry! Oh my god, damn. I'm so sorry. That's crazy. Oh my god. Matt's first viral video received 20 million views in less than 48 hours. And thanks to social media, Matt has been able to take his career to new heights. Now, at 28 years old, Matt is headlining a world tour called Problematic, which started July of this year in Oregon and will end next October in Italy. I'd be lying if I said that this isn't impressive, given how young Matt is and how quickly he blew up. In addition, Matt's released four comedy specials in total. The first three, only fans Matthew Stephen Reif and Walking Red Flag are available on his YouTube channel. However, Matt's newest comedy special, Natural Selection, was released on Netflix just a few weeks ago, which is major because this means Matt's comedy will reach a much wider audience. Again, can't say I'm not impressed. Outside a few viral TikToks, I didn't know a lot about Matt before this recent controversy. I thought his crowd work was pretty good, but I'm not a fan of his dude bro style of comedy. <laughs> That's the only way I can describe it, and it's also the unofficial 14th comedic genre. And you know what? That's okay. I'm clearly not the audience he's tailoring to, and not everything is made for me. 
Fine. With that being said, the red flags started popping up before natural selection even dropped. Variety published an interview with Matt Reif about natural selection the day before its release. The journalist asked Matt about the demographic of his audience, to which he replied with, one of the biggest misconceptions of things I get ridiculed online for is people are like, oh, he only has a female fan base. In the beginning, yes, because I did blow up on TikTok, which is very female dominant. So I get that perspective. But when you come to the shows, I mean, it's 50-50. It's couples coming out, it's groups of dudes who are coming, and that's one thing that I wanted to tackle in this special, was showing people that like, despite what you may think about me online, I don't pander my career to women. I would argue that this special is way more for guys. It's guys being dudes. I wanted to make this special for everybody. So is this special for guys or for everyone. Whatever. I pride myself on making my comedy for everybody. Well, f all right. It's not for a specific demographic. I think if people would just give it the chance without going into it and being like, oh, only girls like him or people only like his face. If you give it an opportunity, I think you'd like it. This is true. Matt does have a predominantly female audience. His fans enjoy his comedy, of course, but one of the main reasons he went viral is because he's conventionally attractive. Allegedly. I'm kidding. He's cute. All right, he's not a bad looking dude. While pretty privilege is a powerful weapon many public figures use to progress their careers, Matt's claimed that his attractiveness is his cross to bear. I started working out way after I was doing stand up. I've been doing stand up for about 12 years now. Yeah, a little over 12 years now. I will say, I don't think it helps you by any means. I mean, people don't want to laugh at like physically attractive people. Like, you don't want to walk on stage and have people looking at your arms rather than listening to your jokes. I think it just makes me work that much harder on the material and the jokes that I'm trying to tell to get people to focus on the real show at hand. Wait a sec. This dude's hot and funny? Talk about a guy with the weight of the world on his big brawny shoulders. But all this makes what happened next even more interesting. I did watch the full special because I take my job very seriously, but I'll only be discussing the highlights, I guess you could say. We might as well start off with the clip that got Matt in trouble in the first place, which you don't have to search very hard for because it's one of the very first jokes in his set. I want to give a trigger warning for domestic violence, misogyny, and ableism, so please proceed with caution. After Matt greeted the crowd at his Washington DC show, he told talked about how he wished his grandfather was still around so they could visit DC together. However, Matt's grandfather's favorite place was Maryland, which Matt described as a mix of beautiful and ratchet. His words, not mine. This was the segue into a story about the first and only time Matt visited Baltimore. He was grabbing lunch with a friend and the hostess had a black eye. Matt quipped that even though they didn't know how she got that black eye, we all know how she got that black eye, apparently. I've only been to Baltimore one time. I ate lunch there, and the hostess who, like, seats you at the restaurant had a black eye. <laughs> a full black eye. And it wasn't like, what happened? Yeah, it was pretty obvious what happened. Matt's friend expressed that he felt bad for the hostess, but they should have kept her in the kitchen. And my boy who I was with was like, yeah, I feel bad for her, man. I feel like they should you know, put her in the kitchen or something where nobody... <laughs> When nobody has to see her face, you know? To which Matt joked that if the hostess knew how to cook, she wouldn't have the black eye to begin with. Yeah, but I feel like if she could cook, she wouldn't have that black eye. So... <laughs> what? You're telling me the guy who idolizes Dave Chappelle and Ricky Gervais would joke about a woman getting beaten? Dave Chappelle and Ricky Gervais, I'd say, are my two biggest influences. They're both prolific comedians and writers and performers, and I would say they're top three of all time. Both of their senses of humor and opinions and views on things are completely in line with how I think about things. Is that so, Matt? I would love to know what other views you guys have in common. According to Matt, he opened with a domestic violence joke to gauge how fun the audience would be because intimate partner abuse is fun. Testing the water, seeing if y'all are gonna be fun or not. Just wanted to see. Just wanted to see. I figured we start the show with domestic violence. The rest of the show should be should be pretty smooth sailing after that. Less than five minutes in and he's already spat in the faces of his female fans. After months or years of supporting Matt by sharing his online content, buying his merch, and getting tickets to his live shows, they get a two-in-one deal. A domestic violence joke and a get back in the kitchen joke. 
Gotta love it. Let's circle back to Matt's Variety interview. If natural selection is intended for a male audience, based on this first joke alone, what does that say about men's senses of humor? About one in three women are victims of intimate partner abuse in their lifetime, and the majority of perpetrators are men. So it concerns me that many of those within the demographic that is statistically more likely to commit violence against someone else would find humor in women getting abused. Not only that, but since Matt's audience is mostly women, according to him, just based on statistics, I'm sure many of them have been victims of domestic violence too. Making fun of women seemed to be the theme of natural selection, at least in the beginning. Right after the domestic violence joke, Matt starts ripping into women who believe in crystals and astrology. Of course I felt bad for her, man. But she should have had her protection crystals, you know what I mean? <laughs> Besides the victim blaming, Matt makes no original observations about astrology girls. I swear to you, man, the biggest issue with crystal girls is the fact that it's their entire personality and they won't shut up about it. Sorry, but has Matt met any crypto bro? If I hear one more person blame how their life is going on Mercury, <laughs> I will kill you myself. Do you understand? You leave that goddamn planet alone. Oh, stop blaming the planets, women. Put away your rocks, cause they make me angry. There are a lot of men who believe in astrology too, but in my experience, the astrology community is mainly women. In my opinion, that entire clip was a giant red flag because it just seems like another instance of a man making fun of women's interests. Not that Matt or anyone has to believe in astrology, of course, but in my opinion, I feel like there are misogynistic undertones anytime a man hates astrology this much. To Matt's credit though, there is one joke I liked in this part, unfortunately. It didn't make me burst out laughing, but I did do a little, you know, a little nose exhale. How I didn't get boogies on my microphone. That would be embarrassing. You only f guys who need to borrow your car, okay? Yeah. That's why your life is in shambles. You worried about Mercury while he crashed in your Saturn. How stupid do you feel? Anyway, the domestic violence joke from Matt's Netflix special began circulating on social media within days of its release, and people were angry. The first response I saw was from a TikToker named Kira, and the discourse snowballed from there. I'll link her page below, but here's a portion of Kira's now viral TikTok. Because you were supposed to picture a woman getting hit because she can't cook, and you were supposed to laugh. Did you laugh? Is that what he means by he made this for men? You want to make fun of domestic violence with men. You want to talk about your grandfather saying he hooked up with Rosa Parks in the front of the bus. Like all of these jokes are dependent on other people's oppression and nuance and things that you don't really need to be touching. If you're wondering why Kira brought up Rosa Parks, she's referencing another story Matt brought up around 11 minutes in. Basically, when Matt was a teenager, he visited his grandmother in hospice care. He wound up getting to know the older gentleman next door who told him a bunch of stories from his life. He told me Rosa Parks. <laughs> I know, in the front of the bus. And <laughs> I was like... I think you have dementia, though. <laughs> I don't think that happened the way you remember it. Also, wouldn't the back of the bus be more private? I, I feel like you could really put in some work back there, but, well. Yeah. This isn't the first time Matt's been called out for racially insensitive behavior, we'll say. For example, Matt has been accused several times of slipping in and out of a black scent in his performances. If you don't know, a black scent is a way of speaking that uses the pronunciation, cadences, or grammatical features of African American English, especially when acquired or affected by a non-black person and now typically regarded as misleading, stereotypical, etc., or as a form of cultural appropriation. A good example would be the I finna be in the pick girl, AKA friend of the channel, Tara's world. I was like, no, like, I finna be in the pit. This is something I noticed when watching a lot of his content. Matt's normal voice does have a bit of a twang. He is from Columbus, Ohio. But I will say that he does put on a bit of a black scent when he's trying to emphasize something sometimes. And it's cringy. 
It's very cringy. However, Matt responded to these accusations on Twitter last year saying, I love when white people accuse me of having a black scent. First of all, you can't sound black. Second, if my voice echoes a cadence or a tone of a certain culture, that's due to my surroundings. My apologies for not living my life exclusively around boring, corny white people. In a resurfaced clip from Wild and Out with Zendaya of all people, Matt talked about wanting to be black and then proceeded to grab Zendaya's face. Hey Zendaya, I'm Nick Cannon. And nah, f that. Uh, I'm Matt Mother Rife, all right? Look, you're mixed. I want to be black. Let's make a lifestyle of <laughs> Spit that water out so I can get your number, please. <laughs> I can't. I didn't touch her. <laughs> she can handle herself. So, uh. <laughs> There's that. By the way, I think Zendaya has every right to sue Matt Reif for emotional distress. I'm also not a lawyer, so. This is also not the first time Matt's been accused of misogyny. A now deleted episode from the Stiff Socks podcast, guest starring, you guessed it, Matt Reif came under fire last year due to some comments Matt made about women's bodies. If I'm gonna date a girl, if I'm okay. gonna date, not just sleep, if I'm gonna date a girl, like she has to have boobs, has to, because it's something I know oh, wow. I'm attracted to. And if she yang. doesn't have that, I know I'll catch myself looking at other ones. Okay, let me and ask you this. Interesting. So, so, so you're doing that out of the kindness of her heart. Be like, I want to yeah. only stare at your tits. Absolutely. Wow. So if what, you don't have, what size is your? What size boob are you? Like a D. Love a D. Wow. Yeah. Have you always been a tits guy, or did you have I this? Think so. Okay. A D. Anything less than a B is like, bro, I have B I cups. fuck with B like, cups. That's what I'm saying. Your tits are, for me, are perfect. Maybe I want to fuck a guy. Um, <laughs> Damn. If I didn't know any better, I'd assume that clip was from that one Nash Greer video from 2014. And of course, like many public figures, Matt has several old problematic tweets that he's tried to scrub, but much to his dismay, the internet is forever. And I would read these tweets out to you, but they... Uh, they have slurs in them, and I'm not saying slurs on my channel. Oh, no, no, no. I wouldn't say slurs ever, by the way. Let me make that clear. Now, you might think that bringing up tweets from 2012 is petty and unnecessary of me. I mean, Matt was only a teenager. People grow and change over 10 years, and... Yes, that's true. I think everyone is capable of growth. But how can we believe that Matt has changed for the better when he was posting shit like this in 2020? Everyone at the Oscars watching to see if the cast of Parasite coughs? In case you've never seen it, the movie Parasite had a predominantly Asian cast, and this tweet was posted a month before lockdown, the time when anti-Asian racism was steadily rising. And we can't use age as an excuse either, cause Matt would have been 24. But Matt responded by saying that it was just a joke and that Twitter was filled with a bunch of crybabies. Unfortunately, that seems to be the opinion of everyone taking Matt's side in this controversy. That the woke left is getting mad at a comedian for telling a joke. Oh, you can't joke about anything these days. So for all the naysayers, for all the Matt Wright defenders, what's the joke? What's the punchline? What are we, the audience, supposed to find funny about this story? After five days of social media users going back and forth about Matt's Netflix special, he finally responded on his Instagram story. The first slide was a photo of Matt with text above that reads, if you've ever been offended by a joke I've told, here's a link to my official apology. And at the bottom, there's a sticker with a link that says, tap to solve your issue. And the link takes you to a website that's sells special needs helmets. These are helmets designed to protect certain disabled individuals from head injuries. The underlying meaning of Matt's post is, if you don't like my jokes, there must be something physically or mentally wrong with you. After watching the full Netflix special, I believe this is a reference to one part of Matt's set where he talks about a special needs student from his high school who was blessed downstairs if you know what i'm getting at people felt sorry for him i was like nah f that dude he's been terrorizing us in the locker room for the whole semester man <laughs> got us all backed up against the lockers like god damn alex that's where the extra chromosome goes <laughs> so if a domestic violence joke wasn't enough Here's some ableism for ya. I should also mention there was a part dedicated to kids who were first to lunch, as Matt described it. Because for, for women, you, you, you can wait till you're older. Like, the older you get, like, don't, don't the odds start to go up right, of, of your kid being... 
first to lunch, we'll call it. Matt expressed that he loves dark humor in his Variety interview from earlier, and that's very clear if you've seen any of his stuff. This is why I think dark humor is the most misunderstood comedic style. And before we continue, I'm not claiming to be an expert in comedy. These are just my opinions and observations as a consumer. Anyway, no matter what kind of jokes you're telling, a good sense of comedic timing is so important. That includes the pacing of the joke and knowing how far to take that joke, especially with dark comedy. It's a balancing act between humor and shock value. Yes, dark jokes are meant to be off color. Their purpose is to shock the audience, and I can appreciate a good dark joke depending on how well it's done and who's telling it. Traditionally, dark humor was used to make fun of your own traumas and hardships. But nowadays, people use dark humor as a cop-out to be edgy and offensive just for the sake of being edgy and offensive. As in, making cheap shots at marginalized groups for the hell of it. I think Matt's domestic violence joke falls into that category because I can only see the shock value in it, not the humor. Plus, it's not even original. Men have been joking about beating women since the dawn of comedy. This is my main problem with Matt's performance in Natural Selection. It's lazy. And the thing is, Matt has delivered decent dark humor in the past. In one of his most viewed TikToks, Matt goes back and forth with a woman who has a nonverbal autistic son. What's his thing that he's really good at? Um, so he's hyperlexic. Hyperlexic, what's that? He's very, very good with numbers, shapes, colors. He's good with they numbers, like shapes, color. and colors. Yeah, that dude about to rob a casino someday. <laughs> You're gonna be a very rich mom someday. There's no cons, bro. You don't gotta worry about him talking to strangers. You don't like talking to nobody. That's awesome. Congratulations. In my opinion, this clip proves that Matt can go there without making cheap shots at anyone. Cause this woman's autistic son wasn't the punchline. The casino was. But if you watch Natural Selection, Matt doesn't make any clever observations. He's only punching down. And not only are the jokes lazy, but they're also juvenile. His humor's no more clever than half the comments I received on my Andrew Tate video. It's all just, I saw this girl at a restaurant and her boyfriend beat her up real bad. Um, anyway, jacking off, am I right, fellas? Yeah, by the way, Matt talked about masturbation for way too long in this Netflix special. I know more about Matt's than I ever wanted to know about anything in my life. And it's all for the sake of validation from other men. But to be fair, um, I did not one but two sex toy ads this past month, so... Who the fuck am I to speak on that last part? However, this is so weird to me because Matt has also made it clear that he's trying to pander to an older audience. He went off for several minutes about how much he hates young people. I fucking hate young people, dude. I really do. Oh. Anybody, anybody my age or younger, you don't have anything to offer me, man. I just, I, you're so rude. Young people are so disrespectful even when they're not trying to be. Personally, I believe this is all intentional. We all know that Matt doesn't like how the majority of his fan base is women, but I think he also resents how they're mostly young women. Going forward, I think Matt is gonna pivot to an older anti-PC crowd, and his stand-up is just gonna get lazier and more offensive. Cause that kind of crowd doesn't really care about the quality of the jokes, they just care that they're as offensive as possible. Sure, Matt's gonna continue to get backlash for the next couple weeks, Weeks, but this is not going to affect his career long term. He's going to go down the same road as all other canceled comedians and claim that you can't joke about anything anymore and still get invited onto SNL and sell out tours just like his peers. I'm very curious to hear your reactions to Matt Reif's Netflix special, so please leave any and all thoughts down below. Do you think his career is over or do you think it's just begun? If there's anything you'd like me to talk about going forward, I have a Google form linked in the description where you you could submit your video ideas. But thank you so much for watching today's video. If you liked it, make sure to give it a tiny, tiny thumbs up and subscribe down below. I love you guys and I'll see you soon with the 12 Days of Sin Miss. Bye! Now watch me whip.